Good to see each one of you here after a wonderful Thanksgiving week. I hope you had a wonderful time with your family and your friends. I had a great Thanksgiving. Uh, the Chicago Bears won on Thanksgiving. We're doing real well. In fact, we're coming out of six years of hibernation, and uh, it's exciting. So we didn't even care about the game tonight. I know some of you do, um, but uh, just exciting, exciting times. We want to welcome you. We also want to welcome our online campus, and we want to welcome those who may be here. We know some are still traveling over the weekend, but we know some travel here to be with their family, and we want to welcome you here today. We also want to give a great big shout out to our college students who are home this morning. Would you give them a great big hand of uh, recognition today? We welcome them as well. Amen. Well, I just want to say that um, my wife nailed it last week. She set the bar really high. Amen. And uh, thankful for the message. I was able to tune in um, after I got through some bad coverage and finally was able to tune in and to listen and to hear the heart of what was being spoken and hear what God did in the service last week. And uh, I just want to say this, that uh, we're grateful for those that join us online through our online campus, but do you realize that there are people that are in Sioux Falls right now that are checking this church out by watching at home? Right now, you've maybe invited them, you mentioned that you go to this church, and, and they've let people know, so through online campus or through our Facebook feed during second service, people are checking things out, and, and in fact, this morning, I mentioned that in first service, um, that literally our online campus becomes a front porch, um, a front door to our church community sometimes as people check it out. And so don't be afraid to share that. Don't be afraid to share the link, SiouxFallsFirst.ChurchOnline.org or um, our Facebook feed and let people know because you don't realize who's watching and who's listening. Um, a family this morning came up to me and said, hey, Pastor, we just want to say thank you um, for your online campus. They said four weeks ago we started watching and uh, we watched this morning and we just made the decision. We wanted to be here second service. So we're, we're glad you're here today. Amen. <laughs> Technology provides some great tools for us to use for his glory and for his name, amen? So if you have your Bibles or devices, you go ahead and turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 25, and when you're turning there, we're gonna pray. So Lord, we thank you for this opportunity we have to be in your house, to be able to join online, Lord, to be able to... Um, place our children in ministries where Jesus is being taught to them in, a, in an environment where they understand. God, we're grateful. We're grateful for what you're doing in Sioux Falls. We're grateful for what you're doing around the world. We know the kingdom of God is advancing. And God, I pray this morning as we open our hearts and we open our ears to hear what you would say to us, what you would speak to us. Father God, I pray the seed of the gospel would find good soil today. I pray that we wouldn't just be stirred, we wouldn't just be moved, but literally, God, we'd be changed because we believe, Lord God, that your gospel, your word, brings life change. So we invite you to come by your spirit, God, to minister and to speak forth today what you wanna to say to your people in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. So on August 3rd, 2017, the Washington Post published an interesting article that stated the majority of Christians believe poverty is the result of individual failings or blame the lack of effort of people to improve their lives. Now, I don't know who they asked. They didn't poll me. However, I will tell you that I've been in the midst of conversations with Christians who confirmed this prevalent attitude. Now we know that scripture speaks of the reality of people who experience poverty because of laziness or because of foolish decisions. Scripture speaks repeatedly of this and we have seen this way too often. And yet to assume that all poverty is based upon a person's work ethic 
or a person's actions is erroneous. It's a false stereotype that so often hinders us in becoming first responders to one of the greatest needs of our generation. You see, we know that people also experience what some would refer to as situational poverty. When someone goes through a divorce, a single mom trying to raise a family, a single dad trying to raise a family, someone experiences unexpected health issues or a job loss or maybe there is a natural disaster or maybe it's an elderly person on a fixed income. We understand that this is often a season that people go through. However, the way that we perceive people, the way that we perceive the poor will either help or hinder us in becoming responders to the needy and to those who are in poverty. I believe God has something to say to us as we continue our series, end our series today, called First Responders, where we have been giving biblical instruction on how to respond, how we as the church is to respond to some of the most gaping wounds in our society that affect people, that affect people groups. And today we're gonna talk about helping the poor. You see, as I began to dive into this subject scripturally, I realized that there's no way in one message, in one service, that we're gonna be able to cover everything that there has to do with the poor and poverty. But I believe these next few moments, God is gonna help me to say what needs to be said to give an overview of how you and I can respond to this great, great need. You see, I grew up in the Quad Cities in the early 80s when the economy was barely moving. And the Quad Cities is the home of agricultural equipment, John Deere, International Harvester. That became uh, Case New Holland. Caterpillar is just a little bit south of there in Peoria. And so we were really hit hard in the 80s. Several of the workers were laid off. We experienced the situational struggle and lack because of the job situation. My dad was laid off. So I really thought we were poor because I wasn't able to wear designer clothes to the preppy high school that I went to after my 20-minute bus ride. I wasn't able to purchase the very first Air Jordans. Came out 1985. I mean, it shocks me when I see these little kids wear Air Jordan shirts and they got the Air Jordans on. Because in 1985, the first ones came out. And by the way, if you happen to have a unblemished pair of them in your closet, they're worth over $2,000 today. Yep. So my mom did the next best thing in her mind is she bought me the Jordan lookalikes. We called them generic Air Jordans. I was pretty excited until I walked into the school and people shamed me. People bullied me. And people robbed me of my dignity because I wore those shoes that my parents could afford. You see, bullying is not just a current problem. It's a problem that goes way back. But as I begin to think about those moments, those years in my life where maybe we didn't have everything, I realized one thing, that we weren't poor. You see, being poor is a relative subject. It really is. It means different things to different people. 
You see, I realized I wasn't poor because I had three meals a day. I had a roof over my head and clothes to wear. I had transportation to school and to church and to wherever I needed to go. I was getting a good education. So when I think about it, I look in the rearview mirror, I realize how blessed I really was. And how in this nation of America, we are really blessed. And I know this past week, we came out of Thanksgiving, and hopefully you were able to share what you're thankful for. But I pray that Thanksgiving becomes more than a holiday. I pray the church of Jesus Christ would begin to turn in murmuring and complaining and, and really begin to enter into thanks living every single day of the week that we begin to count and appreciate the blessings that God has really bestowed upon us. And then realize, because God spoke this over our father Abraham, that when we are blessed, then we become a blessing. We realize that God has blessed us with purpose. We believe that God has blessed us for a distinct reason. And because we have been blessed... We are committed to helping people break out of the cycle of poverty. That we are committed to become the first responders to the societal need, to the, to the gaping wound that exists even among us right here in our own city. That exists in some of our families. That exists in our nation and even in our world. You see, I believe as followers of Christ, we are in a strategic position to elevate the poor in our society through the power of the gospel where the trend has been toward an increasing dependence on the government, which only has potential of enslaving people in a lifelong cycle of despair, never feeling like they can go further than that. Never feeling like that they can go beyond where they are. You see, I believe government assistance is necessary and helps us during a difficult season, but it's never meant to be our source. That God is our only and our distinct source. And he gives us perspective on biblical economics and the way that we are to live our lives that will help us propel forward in the mission and the vision that God has for our lives. Ironically, the word of God has a lot to say about the poor in our response to that need as a church. I want us to begin by looking at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 25. And let me give you a little bit of the scene. This is an end time passage where Jesus is speaking about separating the sheep from the goats. We understand sheep. Sheep belong in the sheepfold. Jesus is the shepherd, so he's talking about his authentic followers. People that are Jesus followers. People that live out the instructions and the teachings of Jesus. The other side are goats. They're wannabe sheep, but they really weren't living their lives surrendered to God. They once in a while may do things that look like they're sheep, but he's talking about this distinction. He's talking about this eternal line that not everybody is gonna be invited into the kingdom of heaven, right? That based upon our relationship with Jesus and obedience to him will determine where we land in eternity, right? So he's talking about the sheep and the goats, and then he says, there's some characteristics of the sheep, my people, that I'm, I'm gonna speak out as I welcome them into eternity, as I welcome them into heaven. Listen to what it says in verse 34 of 25. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. 
I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, brothers and sisters, you did for me. Wow. He's talking about being a first responder to the needy, to those who are in poor. In fact, Jesus is saying whenever we use what we have to elevate the poor, to elevate those who are struggling, to elevate the needy in our society, those who don't have something they need, that we are actually ministering to Jesus. It's like a direct line to Jesus when we respond to the needy among us. In fact, Proverbs 19, verse 17 says, whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and he will reward them for what they have done. What you will see in scripture from Genesis to Revelation is that God assigns responsibility to you and I, to the church of Jesus Christ, to respond to the needy among us. And I know every single one of you in this room this morning and those watching online and those who will listen to this message later have a real desire to do that. You wanna help, you are moved by poverty. You see situations that trouble you. You struggle when you see someone that is going through difficulty, when they're going through a hard time. When they're going through a crisis, you wanna help. But sometimes we don't know how to help. Sometimes we don't know what to say in a hostile climate where every topic we bring up creates a dogfight. It's sad. And it only hinders us in taking our biblical place and doing what God has called us to do. In fact, we are never ever to allow the voices of culture and the condition of culture and the political climate, climate to keep us from responding to our biblical duty and our mandate to be the church. Never allow us to be affected by all the noise in this world. So this morning, I wanna take the next few moments and I wanna share a couple of foundational truths that I believe will, will enable us to help the poor will help us to biblically respond to poverty. Because here's what I learned. God has a lot to say about this topic. He has a whole lot to say about the needy and those who are struggling and those who are, who are uh, battling this spirit of poverty. So the, the first truth is this, that poverty is a mindset, it is not measured. Poverty is a mindset, it is not measured. It is easy to react to poverty and to oversimplify the problem when we really don't have an understanding of what it really is. You ask most Americans to define poverty in one sentence and they will tell you that it is the lack of material resources, that they will simplify it with a statement that it really has to do with what people have or what they don't have. They would say it's someone who doesn't have enough money to pay the bills. They would say that it is someone who doesn't have adequate housing. Maybe they don't have access to clean water. Maybe they don't have good health care. 
And I will tell you that this is the fruit of poverty, but it's not the root. Poverty is not based upon our income level, and it's not defined by what we have or don't have. It's a mindset. I've seen wealthy people who have a poverty mindset. And I have seen people with little or no resources around the world who had an abundance mindset. You see, poverty is a deep-seated belief that there's never enough, which simply influences our behaviors concerning things like opportunity, faith, and progress. It's a way of looking at things. It's a way of measuring the different things that are going on in our lives. You see, poverty is brokenness. Poverty is associated with a lack of hope. Poverty often deceives people into thinking they are inferior to others and sometimes will even make them think that wealthy people are bad people. You see, poverty is a stronghold that the enemy plants in our mind in order to keep us where we are, to keep us from forward movement, to keep us from progress, and to keep us from experiencing everything that God has for each person. It's a limiter, it's a governor that the enemy will put on us in order to hold us back. With that being said, responding to poverty is more than just offering tangible resources. Now, we know it's part of that. We understand that God will call us to do specific things for specific people, but it has to be more than that. We have to be willing to engage with people in relationship and walk with them so that they understand this new mindset that God wants to give to them where they begin to look at things differently. They begin to think differently. You see, when we don't get this right, we actually will hurt people more than help them. I think that's happened. I think that's taken place. You see, the Christian response to poverty begins with the identity of every person, which is rooted in a biblical understanding of the creation mandate. In fact, in Genesis chapter one, I want you to write this down or read this later. Verse 27 and 28 says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. You see, God very clearly states his intentions over humanity in these couple of verses after he tells us that we were all created in the image of God. So we know that the purpose of humanity began in the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve were told to take dominion And we're called to expand everything that God had given them. In fact, we see in this passage that our work becomes our worship. Our work is a way that we honor God. You see, God placed them there to tend it, to take care of it, to develop it, and to work. He planted them there for a purpose. And that same very purpose he has given to every single one of us today. You see, we see this same principle in the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25. He said that everybody has been getting a cer- given a certain measure and they take that and they're, they're supposed to use it to develop it, to expand it, to serve others. That was God's creation mandate that we see again in this specific parable. That is God's intention for us. In fact, I love what Dr. Art Lindsley, the vice president of theological initiatives at the Institute for Faith, Work and Economics said. He said, people are made in God's image, 
to use their creativity to develop the potential of creation. Only God created something out of nothing, but we are called to create something out of something. To take the stuff of creation and use our creativity with respect to it. And you see, the reason a poverty mindset struggles to produce is a misunderstanding of the call of God upon their humanity. They begin to sense worthlessness. They lack value. They lack an understanding of the way God made them, and they literally find themselves in a place of inferiority. That's why, as the church of Jesus Christ, we who are called to be first responders to the poor must emphasize first and foremost their identity in Jesus Christ. Their human potential. That we begin to speak over them to a higher place that we understand the importance that we help them see that their lives are valuable and that their lives are fruitful because that's how God wired them. That's how God designed them. That's how he made them. You see, that's why it's important for us to balance, to... to to balance charity and dignity. You see, I'm, I mentioned to you that in high school I felt like somebody robbed me of my dignity. So when we are responding to these great needs, it's important we balance charity and dignity. I've been on missions experiences where in the midst of charity, people were robbed of dignity that the people that left might have got photo ops and they're excited and they did so much for this person. They come back and testify to the church, but the people that were left behind after the resources ran out felt pretty bad about themselves. They still had that mindset that was detrimental to their progress. You see, I wanna encourage you this morning that the poor don't wanna be seen as a project. They don't want to be an experiment. In fact, I like the old adage that they don't want free fish. They want you to teach them how to fish. So life can still become more favorable even when you're gone. You see, God has a plan and it's important for us to adapt the plan of the kingdom to the way we execute our ministry to those in need. In fact, I, it's really about helping people find purpose. And that's the way we address poverty. Helping people find purpose. I love our missions teams that go out of this house for years. There have been missions teams that went to different parts in the world, many of them uh, very needy places, third world places. And even over the next year, we're gonna have 10 more teams go and I challenge you to find a place that uh, you can sign up, sign up your family and you can go and experience um, that, that cultural uh, blessing of being able to minister to other people. But uh, last year, I believe, um, there was a team that went to Costa Rica. And when they went to Costa Rica, they had planned on doing something that will impact that region, impact that area long after they're gone. And so they went, they preached Jesus, they declared the gospel, many gave their lives to Christ, many hearts were transformed. But in the midst of all that, they imparted this technology of aquaponics. It's, it's aquaculture. Basically what it is, is you raise fish, marine life, and at the same time, 
in that same environment, you can grow plants without soil. And so this team went over there, and I know that um, we also have done that or are doing that in the nation of Sudan, but they, they will go in and they will teach these people and, and give them purpose and say, here's how to sustain momentum, here's how to sustain progress. And, and they taught them how to raise their fish, how to raise their food, and then how to raise their crops. And not only that, but they were able to raise food for their family, for their village. And not only that, it taught them that they can be entrepreneurial, that they can become business people, and they can sell these things. And, and all of a sudden, it's not just a one and done, that literally their lives have been changed because there was biblical response to poverty in a situation where the gospel transformed a community. Hallelujah. Because, because a team was willing to make an investment and even ministers there and churches there were willing to walk with them and to continue to invest in these people to literally transform their lives and transform their family tree. You see, there may have been generational bondage over your family when it comes to poverty and you're standing right here and you may look behind you and as far as you can see, parents and grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents, you look back and you see this generational chain of poverty that you feel like is attached to you and, and it's holding you back. But I will tell you that you stand in a very strategic place. Because even the book of Isaiah says that God is all about creating the foundation of first generations. That he's all about saying, you know what, I really, I'm, I'm really not, my, my, my plan is not determined by your ancestors. And, and, and what has happened with your ancestors doesn't have to be something that happens to you. And this can be framed in any way, and spiritually, and with sin, and with bondage, and with, with, with any kind of thing that the enemy would try to put on you. What was in the past of your family, what used to be in your family tree, does not have to be in your descendants. Amen? Amen? That you can stand right here and say, that's enough. The blood of Jesus Christ breaks that generational bondage and that generational pattern. And from right here on, we are going to change it because our mindset has been changed. And we know that we are going to incorporate something different for our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. As many as the Lord will call. As far as your generations will go, God has a better plan than you do for your family. And I believe with all of my heart, God is gonna use you, God is gonna use our church to break the back of poverty in people's lives, in our community, wherever he's planted us. I believe he's called us to reach out to people. I believe he's called us to minister to people in a way that gives them dignity. The second truth is this, is poverty is only broken as the gospel is embraced. You see, Jesus, I love this, Jesus was coming into town before his ministry really began. He comes into the temple, as was his custom, and he walked right up to the pulpit, to the podium, and he opened up the word. He opened up the scrolls to Isaiah chapter 61. And at the very beginning of his ministry, he gave his mission statement that was only going to be possible by the anointing and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So look what he says in Luke chapter 4, verse 16 and, or 18 and 19. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So I want you to notice in the very first mention of the mission of what God his Father had called him to do on this earth. The very first thing he says is to proclaim good news to the poor. Do you think that's important? 
It's the law first mentioned. That it's such a priority that he makes sure that he says that very first. You see, because Jesus understood the implications of poverty. He knew the cultural and political and economical influences that would come through other relationships. He knew the disadvantages that people faced because remember, he was a refugee. And remember, he at times didn't have a place to lay his head. That he became poor so we could experience the riches of his grace so he understood poverty. He knew what he was talking about. And yet he said, I've come to give good news to the poor. Listen, you're not gonna find good news on the media, no matter who you're listening to. And let me just surprise you, you're not gonna find good news on Facebook or Instagram. We live in such a climate that any topic is polarizing and becomes hostile and nobody brings a solution. And here we are today in the church, in the training center, in the sending center, and we're opening the manual for life. We're opening God's word and what God says about kingdom and how we are to operate under a king that wants the best for us, that wants the best for your family, that wants the best for your neighbor, that wants the best for our city. Listen, there's nobody that wants to break poverty more than Father God. And so Jesus said, he came to town. He said, I came to proclaim good news to the poor. Because often you get the bad news. And often the problem with poverty is that good news becomes a, a thought cycle in your head that it's never going to get better. That we're never going to get out of this. That it's circumstantial and we look around and, and, and we don't see any hope. And God comes with a completely different script. He said, I've come to give you good news. There's a way out of this. And the way out is the gospel. The incarnational gospel. That we are willing to walk with people. We're not looking down on them. We're not trying to reach down to pull them up. We're walking with them. If they're on the ground, we're getting down on the ground with them. Right? We're linking arms with them. We're saying, listen, we, we know it's hard. We know it's difficult. And my wife is so good at empathy, and I, I see that empathetic moment. But it's living an empathetic life where we can say, listen, I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. I see where you're at. I see your pain. I see your need. But listen, we are not going to stay here. Because Jesus said he was anointed, and he anointed his church, and he authorized his church to, to make life's people better. To make the lives of people better. To, to bring them into everything that God has for them in his kingdom. He's got a heart to do that. You see, poverty alleviation is really about relationships. It's igniting God-given dignity into the hearts of the poor by enabling them to be who God created them to be. It's allowing them to see a picture that a poverty mindset will never see. The gospel becomes clear before their eyes and they see the potential of their life. That's what God wants to do through you. That's what God wants to do through me. One life at a time, one family at a time. Listen, when we share the good news and our lives. That was Paul's model. He didn't say, I didn't just share good news. My wife mentioned that a little week. Sometimes we just want to give the good news and we want to slap it on like a band-aid and walk away. Listen, if Jesus was in our modern context, he'd get in the car with you. He would jump right in there with you. He would go to work with you. He would sit at your family table. He would listen to the struggles and he would Listen very intently, but he would let you know that tomorrow is going to be a better day because the gospel brings hope. Listen, when we do that, when we share the good news and our lives, we give the silenced 
their voice again. We give those who feel like they're ignored a reminder that Father God's attention is on them. You know what else we do when we share the good news and our lives? Is we present them a choice they've never had to break the cycle of poverty in their lives and in their future. Because the gospel is the answer to poverty. It's the only answer to poverty. Amen? Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Father, we love you today. And God, we're reminded that Solomon said in Proverbs 21, 13, he said that when we ignore the cries of the poor, that we will cry out as well and not be answered. We know, Lord God, that you told us that we are to be first responders to the needy of our city, of our neighborhoods, because that's who you were. And Father God, we understand that we respond to people with relief. And God, there are moments where, Lord, we are given the opportunity to give alms. We, we hear the Spirit of God speak to us and we help someone. God, we partner with organizations like Convoy of Hope where, Lord God, in natural disasters, even like in Paradise, California, where a, a city has been leveled, Lord God, because of, because of our giving, our generosity, we're responding with relief. But Father God, we know it's more than relief. We know what we talked about this morning is restoration. And Father God, we wanna get beyond just a, a one moment we want to lead people from surviving to thriving. God, help us do that. I pray for a reignited compassion in the church of Jesus Christ this morning. God, because we know while a poverty mindset needs to, needs to change, we know sometimes the mindset of the blessed needs to change. Because sometimes we are over simple. Sometimes we are reactive. Sometimes, God, we just give a, a phrase, a, a catchphrase that this just needs to happen to get them to a better place instead of listening and understanding where they're at and helping lead them into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that changes everything. So God, help us at Sioux Falls First. Help us as the church to biblically respond to the needs of the poor, of those in poverty. With heads bowed and eyes closed all across this place this morning, for those who are watching online. Mother Teresa once said this, the greatest poverty known to man is the poverty of spirituality. That you could be the wealthiest person in this world and be the most bankrupt because you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen, he came to bring his kingdom into your home, to bring his kingdom into your heart. He's a generous father that gave everything so that you could experience the inheritance of his kingdom. And you may be here today and realize I'm living a broken life. I'm living an empty life. I realize life is not going the right direction because I'm not following after Jesus. And by not, uh, not following after Jesus, you're not following his plan. But you'd say, Pastor Quentin, today I'm here and I want a relationship with Jesus. I want to commit my life to Jesus Christ today. I want to receive the invitation that he has given me today. And he's welcomed me into his kingdom. He's walking me to be a son, a daughter of God. If that's you today, would you slip your hand up and wave at me in this room? Anybody here today on the floor, in the balcony, who would say, Pastor Quentin, pray for me. I need a relationship with Jesus. Anybody here today? Amen. I see that hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? Church, would you stand? I see that hand. God bless you. Church, would you stand? I'd like to ask our prayer team to come. 
Here's what I'm gonna ask you to do today. If you raised your hand, I want you to grab the person, the person's hand next to you and say, would you go with me? Would you, would, would you lead me down to our prayer partner so I can receive prayer? But here's how we're gonna close out. The team's gonna lead us in a song of worship. But if you're here today and there is any lack in your life, whether it's a lack of healing, whether it's a lack of financial resources, whether it's a lack of peace in a relationship, maybe, I know my wife mentioned this last week, but maybe it's a lack of peace in your mind, whatever you're walking through, we have a generous Father who wants to meet your need, who wants to minister to you so that when you walk out of here, you won't walk out like you walked in. You may walked in kind of heavy, right? Weighted down. Listen, you can walk out light as a feather if you let God minister to you today. So we're going to open these altars and we want you to experience what God has for you. So be bold. Take that step of faith and let us pray with you this morning as we lift up his name. Come on.